Before we dive into the video, here is a quick note from today's sponsor. In light of the log4 shell vulnerability in December 2021, Sneak is hosting what they call the Big Fix, an online event to make security 100 times better in 2022. When you fix vulnerabilities in your projects, you'll earn swag, including some free t-shirts. The goal is to fix 200 and 2,200 vulnerabilities. So that's 2022 with an added two zeros at the end of it. Right now, 63,762 vulnerabilities have been fixed. Plus, the Sneak Team is hosting a 24-hour live stream on February 25th, where you can get hands-on support from security experts and attend a ton of great educational sessions. So if you have a backlog of vulnerabilities, now is a good time to start fixing. Here's how it works. Number one, register for the big fix. Two, create a free sneak account. Three, scan your projects and merge a fix pull request. When you fix at least one vulnerability, you'll get a free t-shirt. It's all totally free and online, and you can register using my link in the video description below. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another YouTube video. We are de-obfuscating some weird, malicious code. So without any further ado, let's uh, dive into it. I've got my screen open here and I am using Remnux, the uh, Linux distribution for reverse engineering malware. And I'm going to fire up a terminal and I have this staged in a malware directory under a VBS loader folder. So I have these two files here. There's this COD, maybe Call of Duty 2020n.vbs and this dsfsfdfs blah 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 dot lnk file so this is a shortcut file uh, of course this is going to end up being some windows malware or windows shenanigans uh, the dot vbs script is really what's going to end up being executed here if the user were to end up clicking on this shortcut file so we could just kind of get started exploring that cod 2020 and visual basic script file so this is where we will begin i will open that up in sublime text however you might use any specific uh text editor you might like and this is where we begin with our deobfuscation efforts now this is written in visual basic script so we would if we wanted to play with this we can go do this on windows maybe get our flare vm set up but Right now, we can start to carve through this code and better understand what the heck it's doing. So we have an on error resume next line. That really just means, hey, if Visual Basic Script were to encounter an error, it'll keep cruising and not worry about it. DIM means it's going to define, hey, a variable with this name will be used within the scope here. And we can actually see that COM200 is going to end up being set to some stuff here. But down below, let's actually try and clean this up. It looks like it is going to end up creating an object for a file system object that allows us to do more things in code with the actual file system, right? So I'm going to rename that variable while it's set as ZZZZZ set to create an object for this. Uh, as is not a very descriptive name. So I'm going to hit control H on my keyboard and rename that to like FSO or file system object. Let's just use file system object. So that's a little bit more understandable. And then GGGGG <laughs> great will just be our uh, public folder. And that's a quick and easy way how we could uh, clean that up. Now, COM200, COM200 looks like it is preparing what looks like a PowerShell command. And I don't know if that immediately is tipped off to you because you can see, hey, eventually an invoke expression, although it is chunked up and broken in an in e, in evoke expression. <laughs> uh, they are using a format string, a tack F to format and put different places of, of, of the variable values here or the data that they're going to input formatting into the string in a different placeholder location. So this zero refers to the I in invoke really the two refers to okay, well, let's go ahead and skip the E here because that would have been index number one. Well, in was index number zero, E is index number one, two is invoke expression. So we could actually clean this up, right? In Voke exp and then you know that number three would be the r that follows and the e it would be that two that was there or that one and then expression if i spelt that all right uh a little bit weird to have that written out that way but that's how you could understand hey what's really being done here and this is going to actually going to end up doing the same thing just as well to create a new object broken up just chunked in a little bit but we can end up saying new object here Part of me is uh, fascinated with these um, 
actual hashtag and Octothorpe things here. Are they using that to like indicate a space? Because it's being able to denote with the tack F there that that is where they're going to end up specifying the format strings that follow here, right? So new object and net.web client really. And they also have these in different renditions of parentheses. So it's bundled and bundled away. So it's not readily accessible like, hey, new object net.web client all in one specific place because that would be much more easily detected by antivirus, excuse me, and signatures, uh, just looking for the static strings on their own, which is why it's chunked up just like this. All of this obfuscation is how they might be able to hide and mask themselves from, hey, trying to actually detonate their malware or do the malicious things. They don't want to get caught by that antivirus. However, they end up using this download string with arguments passed to it through invoke with that reflective way through it, and to this location, HTTPS, paste, E, D, and that link here. So that would be worthwhile to grab. Oh, 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 oh. They actually end up using the um, hashtag or octothorpe or pound symbol and replace it with double quotes here. So that would make it a string, which would allow them to very easily include these uh, and be able to reference that kind of syntax even through the parentheses and objects here while using this ampersand to run code like an invoke expression or like an eval uh, in another PowerShell syntax. So I'm going to assume this syntax, it being PowerShell, will be passed to PowerShell. And you can probably see that down below already if you're paying attention here. So this COM2 will go ahead and remove all of those. This, uh, I guess I haven't properly corrected this line, but COM200 can be uh, PowerShell syntax. We'll just call it that. And now our dub, 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 z, 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 z is going to end up creating a text file for ahmed40000.ps1 uh, in the public folder location. So that will end up writing this PowerShell syntax that's going to end up downloading that from that location. And of course, after maybe 30 seconds, is that right? One would be a 1,000 would be one second here. So we could just say uh, written PS1 script. We write that, we close the file, and then after 30 seconds, we end up running it through our wscript.shell. CHR80, of course, is going to return P. We could determine for PowerShell.exe, giving it an execution policy bypass. So we're going to completely disregard whether or not you have enabled or disabled the ability to run scripts on this Windows device or on the actual victim and target. The execution policies that are set for PowerShell are not meant to be a security boundary. Uh, you might jump into a new Windows machine and maybe you're cranking out some PowerShell code because you're a system administrator, you're an IT professional, you're doing whatever you do for automation. Windows will say, hey, I can't run scripts here until you turn this into setting the execution policy to something like remote signed or unrestricted if you want to go like, hey, off the wall. If you use execution policy bypass, even while you're just invoking PowerShell, completely disregards all this and that can just be circumvented and the execution policy is not considered a security measure. Keep that in mind if you didn't already know that. Then we go ahead and run the syntax because we're firing up that script. And this next section down here, um, I don't know again if you could tell, but this is going to end up being for strictly persistence. Uh, this is how it actually latches onto the computer system here. We've got, hey, an object created for our Windows script shell. Let's call that W script shell. Uh, another variable that's declared with dim, but then being set to, oh, the startup special folders. There you go. We'll call that startup folders. And then this KKKKKLLL one will create a new shortcut, which is exactly that shortcut file that we just saw in the directory here, pointing towards the W script script full name, as in this file itself. And that's how it's going to end up, hey, being able to still run this Visual Basic script every time the computer is turned on, just automatically. Call that LMK file. Good enough.
Okay, so we know that this has just been a small stager and it's going to end up executing the code present on this paste bin like website paste E on this location. So let's see if we can go reach that. Uh, I'll go ahead and get back to my terminal here and I will curl that location. Maybe will that reach it? Oh no, error code. Why is that? Is it no longer available? Hmm. Does it need to come from a specific browser? Let's try it with Firefox. Okay. Ooh. This looks like it has some <laughs> spice to it. So I'm going to copy. Uh, I'm hitting Control A on my keyboard to copy literally all the text here uh, or select it all. And now I'll go bring this back to our Sublime Text window where we can just simply call this like Stage 2. Uh, and we know that this is PowerShell. This is our Ahmed 40,000 script. We'll call it .ps1. And now that's been word wrapped. So this is a little bit easier to read and make sense of. However, we still have a lot of long, disgusting variables here. Uh, there's this TTTS00 noise and nonsense. And another big one down here. I feel like we've seen this structure before. Um, I, I definitely think we have seen this before. With that said, oh, we can see at the very, very end as I scroll all the way across, uh, we are replacing all the at signs in here, the at zero, zero with at signs with a simple zero, because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of null bytes, because what we're seeing here is likely hexadecimal, uh, a hex representation of some binary or some file or something else being ran and, and executed through this. And that's actually what this function here looks like is going to end up carving out for us. We'll take in a parameter, a mandatory parameter that is given this argument variable name, ASD20199. We could just simply rename that to like, hey, argument one. And now we create a new object, bytes based off of the argument length divided by two. Why would it be divided by two? Well, because hexadecimal representations of bytes are going to come in two hex values, like zero zero to represent a null byte or hex six one to be the letter a capital a i think i i hope so <laughs> talking at a, a off off the cuff here but so this is going to end up being length and now we'll cut through the length of it being i working up to the length of the original passed in string so all of this data here one at a time by two, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, we, we step by two, so we get one byte, like zero, zero, another byte, zero, one, another byte, zero, two, etc. by taking the substring there of i and then two characters forward. And then we consider it an integer while we convert it base 16, hexadecimal, right? So we're taking the hexadecimal byte value from each of these. Let's actually change that function name to convert from hex. I know that's going to make a little bit more sense for us. So this big long thing will be uh, data one, we can call it. And this function we can kind of hide because this big long thing at the very, very end here, yet another extremely long payload. Uh, actually has, does it have another replace at the end? It does. You can see that right here. So all of the exclamation point periods will be replaced with null bytes or, or zero here. And this, uh, again, probably the very, very end, we're going to see a lot of null bytes. So that's just fine. We know it's likely a binary file considering it's represented in hexadecimal. We can see, hey, this starts with a 4DMA uh, value. And I believe, I'm trying to think of what that might be the header for a file here. But again, let's just change this to data2 because we know that we will have something data2 converted from hex. Let's say that can be raw data2. And then our convert from hex data1 up here. Let's call that, that's the raw data1. And then we will use some PowerShell magic to reflectively load an assembly or a .NET assembly. Uh, we see raw data 2 will likely be a executable file that is a .NET assembly, which we would then be able to run with 
uh, or at least examine and kind of peel back the layers behind with something like dnspy, ilspy, .peak, or other tools like that. So we can get into that, and we've done that before in other videos, so we're not doing anything crazy new here. But this run pee, run p, get method run, uh, looks like it will invoke a, ooh, actually pass in arguments with red services.exe um, and our raw data one executable or, or what we ever determined this to be. So we'll, let's carve out those values. Let's take data two um, and end up putting this puzzle piece together here. I will uh, grab all this code and see if I can actually use this with PowerShell. Now, do I have PowerShell? There we go, okay, cool. So I'm gonna define this function just like that. Now I have, I'll move this to the other side so my face is in the way. Okay, I have convert from hex as a uh, function that I can run with a mandatory argument one as you saw defined over here. Now we could actually take our data one string, again, slap all this in, oof, that's gonna be a little bit of a mess. <laughs> we could actually probably run this script. Let me do that instead. Um, and let's stop the portions uh, here. Kill that, please. <laughs> let's let's not go ahead and reflectively load this yet. So I'm commenting out that last line there, but I do want to like write these out. So let's do raw data one out file to data1.bin, because we're going to assume that's a binary file, and we'll do the same with data2, data2.bin. Now, can I pwsh on our stage2.ps1? Hopefully, 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 hopefully. It might be taking a little bit because there's some, it's a hefty file there. There we go. Okay, cool. Now that has finished, and I see those files present here. Let's see what is our data1.bin ascii text did i do that wrong how about how about data2.bin also ascii text okay i definitely did something oh it's because it's bytes it's because it is bytes like if we were to open up that data1.bin it's all of the actual byte values not all that helpful um there's there's got to be a powershell um, whoa. From bytes to file? Write bytes to file. Yeah, that's what I need. System convert, no, set content out value decoded encoding byte. Ooh. Th that is kind of slow. I'm reading this comment here that says it could take 10 seconds. Why is it so slow? I mean, that could very well work. Oh, IO, IO file write all brights will do it just as well. And you can give it the specific location. Yeah, why not just do that? Why not just, let's just do that. So write all bytes for data one dot bin can be raw data one. And then we'll do the very, very same for data two. There's some quick learning. There's some quick tiptoeing, some tap dancing on our feet. Run that. Oh, that's significantly faster. Probably because it didn't have to write out all that nonsense. And now our file data one dot bin is in fact an executable file uh, ooh, that is not a DLL, or that is not a .NET assembly. So data two is the one that, as we know, was actually going to be able to be loaded as a reflective assembly. So we could explore data two, or that one over here, uh, with IL spy, but doing the other one, we might not be. That uh, data one is something that we'd have to open up in a debugger or disassembler or something that we could actually kind of walk through and play with. Now, not a big deal. Uh, let's kind of see what our data two wrapper is to get started with. I'm gonna end up using IL spy on that. Uh, I wanna see if I can bring this over to our Flare VM. 
because that has going to have a better understanding. If I were to use something like IELTSBY, it'll know all those Windows things that it needs. Uh, let's set it on dark mode for all you vampires that watch my content. Um, and let me pause the video for a quick second to see if I can drag this into the VM. Okay, so I've just dragged in data2.bin, and did Remnux say that was a DLL? Yes, it did. Um, so let's see, data2.dll, and what did Remnux say the original one was? That's just going to be a GUI, a flat executable. Cool, okay, so modify that just as well. Now, we could use ILSpy and actually open that up, that DLL. So I'm going to do that. Going to go grab our data2.dll, and it will try to decompile it. And I want to amp up the text size here because this is a little bit too small for you to see, I think. Uh, let me change the font to something like, yeah, 16. Is 16 okay? How's that look? You guys able to see that? I don't know why I'm asking as if you can answer, but assembly product name is X. <laughs> assembly title is X. Spooky. So we knew from Remnux that this was going to end up calling, uh, after it is reflectively loaded in, a run PE, or <laughs> literally run P file. Uh, run PE probably being the class name. Run PE also is the, no, no. So namespace, class, and then method run. Is that fair to say? And let's get back to Flare to see that. There we go, we have a run P. We also have X. And what is X doing? X is gonna display some stuff? About box? I don't like that these are all, oh, this is, this is encoded in some way. Or obfuscated yet again. But it's got components and it's gonna end up displaying things. Uh, I feel like the, the run PE sounds again, very, very familiar. I feel like we've seen this, this family, uh, and malware strain before, like the remote access Trojan. I'm sure we're going to end up finding, um, and there it is. Here's run PE. They're going to pull in a lot of necessary default boilerplate structs so that it can use win 32 API, uh, functions that it might pull out of DLLs. The dynamic link libraries are part of the internals of the Windows operating system. They, things from kernel32.dll, we want to be able to create process, get thread context, set thread context, etc. Read process memory, write process memory, execute any code that we might like. And here is our public static bool run string path and bytes data. It just threw me to some other location. So let me, let me expand this. Um... I don't know why it's going to end up doing all these checks. I feel like this is a, a couple shenanigans, but this function looks very, very obviously out of place because it's not a Win32 API function. That is one that will probably end up trying to do some things to run this code because that is exactly where it passes path and data, which were the arguments that were passed into this function. So disregarding literally all of these shenanigans, if something were to actually happen and occur, which we can assume that it would, it would probably be through this function, E1, F, Z, R, Q, blah. We could try and run D4 dot to see if this can deobfuscate some of this for us. Um, but it looks like, hey, it is gonna end up starting new processes create process, ooh, virtual alloc x to allocate memory. Passing in things as needed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to very much assume, hey, you might be doing some shell code injection with write process memory. You might be trying to do some uh, process hollowing or shenanigans, um, creating some things. Uh, oh, actually, this is exactly what happens because this E1F thing that was called through run and run PE does this, which that one doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but we did just see this taking in the path and data passed in and actually passing it to handle run, which would go ahead and create these processes. So... We can very much assume whether it's going to do some sort of shenanigans, it will run that next 
data one dot bin file that we assumed. Um, and we could try and open that up in a debugger, uh, but I will probably make a very much of a fool of myself because uh, I'm not good at that. <laughs> I'm already in a, in a world that I'm not uh, strong in when I crack open IL Spy. But it is just a matter of looking around and exploring. There's no shame in that. So we have some debuggers here. Do we have WindyBag? We have WindyBug.x86 and WindyBug.x64. I also think we had some x64 shenanigans, but maybe... Uh, we don't have immunity. Obviously, that's way too old, but Windy Bag might be kind of fun to play with. I haven't done, I haven't opened a Windy Bug since like OSC, OSED, OSED. Not gonna lie. So I don't think I even remember how to do things. <laughs> um, it also would be good to fire this up in like Ida, because we have Ida free here. Do we have Ghidra? Oh, we do have Ghidra. How's Ghidra doing? Okay, so Ghidra needs us to create a project. We can go ahead and create one, super simple. Um, I don't think I'm gonna end up exploring more of this, so honestly, let me put this in temp. Well, th is, is the internet gonna be okay with that? Are people gonna whine? You guys are gonna whine no matter what I do, so why not just uh, <laughs> why not just make a make a mess? Mm, VBS loader is a fine name for what we're still doing. Yep. So now we need to press I to import some here, and I put this back in temp. See, uh, Windows temp. Uh, maybe did I put it in tasks? No, I put it in temp. Oh, I put it in app data local temp. Crap. I don't want to have to dig through all those users, malware, app data, local temp. Goodness. Data1.exe. Select file to import. VBS loaders, default Windows PE. Sounds good to me. And we can let that thing go. Um, while it's doing that, we have carved out the executable file itself. So on its own, that might still be something that we could just kick to, hey, give it to virus total, give it to some other analyzed spots and see what it, what it thinks it's doing. Missing a couple of those resources, it seems like, maybe, but it is loading the DLLs as it needs them. So we could see what some of those imports are um, and what other shady DLL things it grabs, but feel free to go ahead and analyze, analyze, analyze as you do. And I will pretend like I know what I'm doing as I look through <laughs> Ghidra when I clearly don't. I would like to check out the functions that would begin here. So entry point is where I would also like to really much kind of get started. Or what is that gonna end up being called? Start, entry point, entry. <laughs> you don't have any PDB files? Entry. Mm. So I will uh, naturally rely on the pseudocode uh, built up over here. It's Interesting to me that I immediately see socket constants, though. Again, I'm out of my elements, so I, I feel like it, that is going to end up being used for some communication and comms, right? Because you're creating a socket, even with, yes, this is completely nonsense, stack variables um, and things that might have been passed in or, or local variables that it's going to end up using in this function. Grabbing some of that stuff or setting some of that stuff as needed, that is cool. And again, this might just be entry, so it's probably going to set up something else that is going to continue to run. Uh, this is really where IDA would be probably a good thing, so we can get an idea for that control flow graph. However, uh, of the symbol tree, yeah, I mean, that's going to be handy in Ghidra here, but does Ghidra have a control flow graph? Yeah, code flow. 
How bad does this look? Oh, it looks good. I'm not gonna lie. So, prelude. Entry, calls, calls, new functions, new functions, new functions, new functions. Uh, why is that, that, that is not easy to see. Everything calls back to this based off of a test if not equal to, jump if zero, in which case it will do different things. And I, I might be totally getting that JL uh, assembly opcode wrong based off of <laughs> just a complete guess off the top of my head. I'm just kind of exploring and none of these assembly instructions are going to rapidly tell me anything that's super cool or fancy. This would probably be much more fun stepping through a debugger and trying to see what functions it does or kicking it in a sandbox and doing the, the, the dynamic analysis on its own, uh, seeing what happens here. So let's experiment with that. If it's totally okay, I would like to pass this to a couple different things. First things first, I wanna throw it to uh, in its Intizer Analyze. Intizer Analyze I'm having a lot of fun with. Uh, they are another all-in-one malware analysis platform and Intizer has this kind of style and that they will try to identify and look through malware samples based off of what they might already be using in other malware samples. So while I feel like I remember seeing this run PE setup and stager in a different video that we've already done, I got to admit, I forget. And whether or not I even upload this because I've, I feel like we've already seen this, I don't know. But uh, I do want to kick in this data one dot bin because maybe this is going to be some rat that's very easily in, uh, recognizable. So let's do that. Uh, let's go ahead and grab what was malware and a VBS loader. Data one dot bin. Uh, do I have to sign up? All right, let me do that super quick. Stand by. Okay, I spent some time cruising through there sign up and now I'll try and upload data one dot bin. Uh, I, again, this is kind of Intizer's shtick. This is kind of their gimmick. This is their, their flair. They'll try to disassemble it based off of uh, their genes or the genetic coding, quote unquote, for different related malware samples. Uh, and I think that's kind of neato. I think it's an interesting idea. They do a little bit of dynamic execution. Of course, they do some static extraction, grabbing strings and all, and trying to take a look at some related samples. Um, interesting that it found Libmono, I guess. Um, compiled in 24, May 24, 2020. Whack. This is taking a little bit of time. Going to have to carve through all this, which is not an issue. Um... Oh, and we couldn't download the samples as needed. Uh, malicious site. <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping we can get more information coming from this. Ooh, yeah. Okay, so there are some some reused things here, allegedly. But I guess that's a ton of stuff. Viewing the shared code is not available at the moment. What? <laughs> um, I didn't even look through strings. Granted, uh... Normally, that's my default, and people make fun of me. <laughs> uh, I Seeing um, the Yandex and Brave software browser local locations, though, same with Chrome, though. I'm gonna, I don't know if that counts as a malicious library, but I'm going to assume it's trying to carve out cookies or things. Or, yeah. Yeah. This has to be some sort of info stealer, I would think. Again, completely just based off of strings. So that's not by any means a good or, or worthwhile uh <laughs> assessment I should be digging through this more but this I'm sure is no, I'm sure is known data one sure is suspicious also still is malicious could be both cool let's see what um, any dot run will find from this uh, and I should try and log in here just as well I haven't set I haven't set the stage here on my remnux device but I'm gonna do that now Okay, so I'm booted up with any run. Let's create a new task. And honestly, I should rename this thing to like the data one.bin. Let's put that like, hey, uh, stage 
three realistically I, I guess you could call that stage four considering that other wrapper is in there stage four dot exe is that fair let's go and put that from our vbs loader stage four dot exe let's go uh, they said it, this was 32 bit did we not and i think we even saw that yeah 386 in both of these analyses so maybe 32 bit would be just fine however doing that uh, on 64 bit would still let it run without an issue we'll use windows 10 just so we have some modern stuff because this uh theoretically was compiled in 2020 but are we already seeing some weirdness not a ton these are default connections to microsoft for i think normal connections for like microsoft cert things i hope uh, but now we're starting to do some weird oddities. I see more connections than usual. I think. Removes files from Windows directory. What do you see something coming through? Netwire rat. That makes more sense to me, but again, I'm just completely basing this off of like you know, any run seems to be very, very confident that this is Netwire. Netwire is an advanced rat. It's malware that takes control of infected PCs and allows its operators to perform various actions. Unlike many rats, this one can target every major operating system, including Windows, Linux, and Mac. Okay. Um where is the confidence that this is that? I'm trusting you guys because I'm too stupid to know this on my own. Is it the C2 that you were using? Is it like one of the IP addresses that it called out to? What gave it away? Uh, 69174981238. That's that's what that's the IP address that I see here. That seems to because one nine two one six eight is going to be local address, which I'm assuming is us. Not going to lie. So six nine one seven four nine eight. Do they have this in the IP address and the indicators of compromise? Mm, nope. Sus. <laughs> OneDrive. Okay, so it's faking as OneDrive. Let me look if there are other reports or things on that. And we'll also kick it to Virus Total. I think that would be worthwhile to do. Um, we could give it the original, like, stager that we saw through all these Visual Basic Script things, but then, I don't know. Let's see what you do. Ooh, that lit up. And people, yep, Netwire, Netwire, Netwire. Have we seen Netwire before? Maybe it was the stager that was just like the usual. I mean, granted, how it's how it's getting onto and maintain and staying on the target is very, very commonly always going to be done with those living off the land scripting language techniques. I, in my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong about that. The actual executable itself, the real bad thing that can be very, very easily uncovered with this string and static detection and behavioral, etc. cetera. Uh, I always, and I, I try to consider this an excuse because I'm not good at that binary exploitation stuff or that binary reversing because I, I don't know. Engines have, have gotten that cracked, figured that out. The executable thing it can only hide in so many different ways. Taking advantage and kind of slipping and sliding around all the other security mechanism things, that's where it gets some other shenanigans. So let's look at netware, Netwire malware and let's see what folks have been chatting about this. Is this still out and about? Let's check out, this is actually very recent. Modified elephant. These are all things in news, but I'm trying to find Cisco Talos has seen some of these. Um, Netwire. 
APT relying on Netwire, both delivering Netwire. This is just a news article, though. There's not a whole lot of technical details. ThreatPost sometimes has some technical merit. This is, oh, this is, again, extremely recent. This is the APT that has been chatting about this. Netwire. Netwire. Is this... Is this, this is a very, very similar, I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have set it to be news when I went to go look through these. Granted, maybe that, because I'm going to keep getting stuff on Modified Elephant. And they're all going to end up saying the same syndicated text. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Let's go Netmire malware analysis. Let's see if there's been some other cool research on this thing. 2020, there's our any run response. I should have opened that in a new tab. Netwire rat. Malpedia has some shenanigans. 2021, being spread by phishing. Oh, image at IMG attachments. That is not what I've seen. Oh, FireEye has something. All right, we're, gonna, we're totally going to check out FireEyes. Nigerian scammers. So Redline is more common in my mind. Netwire is down low with 15 rank. This is 2021. Or, oh, no, this is observed in 2020 as the most common. Hey, info stealer, credential stealer, remote access Trojans, etc. So... Netwire originally usually passes through phishing through PDF, Word, and IMG files. Now, IMG files are, in my mind, going to be the future because now Microsoft has gone and disabled or saying, hey, we're not going to be doing macros anymore. So uh, initial access vectors through Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and everything in that world, bye-bye. Um, now we're going to be think, uh, in my mind, pivoting more and see more and more of IMG, um, and ISO files just as well to try and stage code being ran. Faked it. Use the 32, get cursor position. Oh. Sweet. Netwire has cross-platform capabilities, according to BlackBerry. Why are people chatting about the get cursor position? The malware will not run until there's a difference in the mouse cursor position? What? That's kind of clever. I didn't see a whole lot of activity when doing this, like letting this run, but it's still kind of did its thing. It, it may very well have, have detected ham in a sandbox. Um, I, complete guess. I, I, I didn't do my own due diligence to dig into it. This is all just for funsies, it, poking around and exploring. So, Okay. Got some YAR rules to track this down. Cool, 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 cool. Ooh. So this, I mean, this is just a classic PowerShell cradle, so it's not saying anything by seeing this on its own on all reality. Hey, PowerShell web client download it's like great everything's going to end up doing that using cutly or tiny url are kind of fancy but again that's that's way too common to say oh wow i see the similar trade craft now it's just a download cradle the c2 ip addresses aren't what we think any run was able to find and carve out i didn't end up doing any of my own like running floss on this do i have floss yeah i do okay so floss on our stage four 
uh, EXE right now. C and Yandex. Blah, blah, blah. Do we have get cursor position? Because that would be kind of pretty cool to see. Get DC. Set cursor position. Whack. I don't see it in get, though. Oh, it might be up higher. In a, in a different um, one that's pulled in. Nettle. What are those things? What is Nettle 3.5.1? Mm. Encryption, cryptography stuff. Hence a lot of the AES data. There's an image in there. Why is there an image in there? I saw I saw an I end. Do I have foremost? I don't. Well, let's get that because that would be kind of funny if there's just like, hey, here's a picture. <laughs> Look at me, netwire rat. No, just EXE. We could try to use Binwalk and be significantly more beaten it up on stage four at EXE. How's that look? Where did you think that you had an image? I don't think you did have an image, dude. I'm stupid. <laughs> Let's just say I'm stupid. Let's just say it's my fault. All right. We were bumping around. Let's look at Fire Eyes. And this was way back. Oh, and it process hollowing. Granted, this was some time ago, 2019. XLS, technical details. Hey. Hey. They're using Pace EE and they're using the at signs. <laughs> Not as close. I don't, I don't know. Still. The, the CR and X and NS, that looks like like the VJ worm. That looks like another Houdini or Hiduni rat. That doesn't... The CR ones, when they have the super short, like one or two letter function name or variable name, that is, I think, a similar one, a similar rat that does something different. But I think that's Hiduni. Sorry, I'm I'm totally distracted and going on a tangent. After further deobfuscation of the download second stage visual basic script, we obtain a PowerShell script that is executed through a shell object, paste EE. They have a again an assembly that they use, and they're going to actually invoke with inst install util. Uh, and that use, by the way, and I did I never actually discussed this, and I probably should have given this more attention. When it invokes this uh, red services.exe and the raw data and the other executable that we run, the reason that it's doing that, and I can at least pretend to sound smart when I do this, uh, is because. If you check out the living off the land techniques, going to their pretty, pretty website, something like using install util, like we see uh, in the FireEye rendition, where is that page? Right here. When they were using install util, and we saw ours using red services, install util is going to use this technique so that we actually execute code bypassing application whitelisting. So if app locker were on, like a default Windows app locker, it totally cool. At least you are spawning this through a native, like inherent Windows built in, Windows binary. That is safe, and we will allow that through application whitelisting. Very, very same when we were doing, hey, red services. Uh, ours here. Execute, super duper easy, AWL bypass. Uh, and they do this with an EXC or excuse me, a, a DLL, can it do it just very well with, because we know that our raw data one is not a uh, executable. Maybe it, because it has a register class function or maybe it's a, that's exported somewhere. Not positive. See, I told you I could only be able to s like pretend that <laughs> for a certain amount of time. <laughs> but look at, this is exactly uh, a hex, 
hex to binary function, just as we saw. PCE, they use base64 for encoding as well. And there is the decoded netwire trojan. Cool. Cool. Some of this uh, .NET code that we saw is also the very, very same it looks like as they were digging through. Flag 2 with booleans to try and run crepe process. And they just kind of took a lot of the excerpts. Nice. So their backdoor of with Netwire receives commands from a command and control C2 server as expected and writes it into a logs directory because this allows the threat actor for some key logging, reverse shell, and password theft. We were assuming password theft considering the presence of all those um, like data directories. But that's interesting. Oh, you can decode based off of a string that you see here. And we saw that when we were just using this, this right here, that is our communication. Oh, and that's actually the exact one that they have too. Nice. This malware contains a custom obfuscation algorithm to hide registry keys, APIs, DLL names, and other strings from static analysis. Mm. Figure 10 right here provides a decompiled version of the custom decoding algorithm used on these strings. So they... What are they doing here? It, they're anding it based off of the byte value adding six from that list of decoded strings we're able to identify some other features. Ooh. Because I'm sure there are other long strings in this output then. Like when we ran our own strings with floss on stage four were there significantly longer strings then that we just didn't see because I, I couldn't scroll up any further? Scrolling through a lot of these Dumbo ones. Oh. Oh, some of these look like they are, are in plain text already. That is totally some HTTP communication though, which makes me think, yep, they are going to be doing that C2 communication comps. There's that key again. <laughs> netwire here i am here's me i am the netwire let me just say it loud and proud boys tell everyone netwire rat netwire remote access trojan you caught me here's my name tag <laughs> that's pretty cool it's kind of silly and fun was a little Firefox. Okay, maybe these are the ones that are meant to be encoded or decoded in some weird, wacky way. Encrypted username, encrypted password? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I know people hate when... John, you're just scrolling through strings like an idiot. You're right, because I am. Well, we saw these just as well. Intizer found these, because I, don't, I wonder if they pulled it through... Um, the decoding string, but I feel like we would have seen these. Like if I grep through our strings for that. Chrome. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Sweet. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. I had some fun with this one. Uh, I, I am pleased to see that virus total just lit this thing up and everyone seems to say, Hey, netwire, 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 netwire. Uh, I feel like any run was also spot on. And is there, I think new, Hey, this is clearly a thing, but I, I, am I missing where it says netwire? Am I missing? Did it give it its diagnosis? It totally saw this spooky IP address though, and did communicate out to it.
Mm. Oh, there was some other interesting stuff that it didn't hear, though. Yep, you could actually see it wrote. It wrote when it installed. Dude, we should run this. We should, like, put this. Because I, I kind of want to see what those values are. Then again, we can do that in any run. I don't need to put it in my own VM at the moment, in my opinion. I mean, that's the value. Hey, we, we did some exploration in a lot of different tools. Let's try, because we, we have a snapshot with Flare. I think it's I think it's fine. It's old. I have not played with this. I have not been in this for a little bit. Let's 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 just run it. <laughs> Are you guys cool with that? Are you guys cool if I just run the malware super quick? We know that it's gonna create oh sorry, uh, the Kali Linux VM. We know that it's gonna create the registry keys of HK current user software netwire. And I wanna be able to see those. Cause I, I'm I do wanna see it fill in the install date and the host ID. So let's fire our bridge at it and let's do this thing. Current user, oops, sorry, software. And we should see it create itself once I run it, but let's go. Let's go to temp. And we have our, did I put it in, or I put it in, yeah. I, I don't. Stage. Stage. Data one, it's called data. Data one dot exe. All right, so watch our reg edit and see if we create Come on, freaking command prompt, data one. Let's see, there is our netwire and there is our host ID and our install date. So that's pretty slick. Now I absolutely want to revert this machine. <laughs> Cause I don't want that connectivity. I don't want that beating up that box, but wow, that was, that was kind of slick. I, I, I honestly thought when we were looking at this syntax, they're like, Oh, the run PE, that looks way too familiar. That's gotta be something that we've already kind of seen before, but I don't think we have a video on showcasing uh, netwire or drilling and finding it and, and discovering it. I think obviously run PE as the name, as this, these words on their own, isn't a, a going to be a good key indicator because it literally means run and portable executable, which anything could do. So while it could be a stager for async rat or hey, what other rat that we've seen way too many of them. Um, sure. That's kind of fun. That's kind of neat. Um, it, I, I can't just rely on, Oh, we see the words run PE. It's not going to be one specific malware strain or family, or it could be loading up anything else. And we've seen a lot of these fun ones. Um, but, we dug through it and we thought, sweet, dude, this is Netwire. Uh, and it is still alive and kicking. We This was found relatively recently. And as you can see, all of the, what is it, malicious elephant, they're still doing some, some shenanigans with this Netwire remote access Trojan. And it could do a little bit of fun stuff based off of, hey, password retrieval, based off of um, with the key logging that it could do. So plenty and plenty of stuff. But that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for hanging out. I know this has turned into a long video as they always do. But <laughs> I hope you had some fun and you just enjoyed hanging out and we'll go do something else similar and like this in the next video. So thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.